so I think we're going to get started. Get this on the nose. Um, and uh, I want to welcome you guys to New Social. Um, my name is Emily Lytle Fisher, and I'm a digital content manager at <coughs> uh, the Los Angeles Times Museum of Art. I see a lot of friendly faces and want coming in, come in, come sit down, all the way to the front, no problem. We have a lot of seats for you guys. Um, we're happy to be here in this big room with so much space to spread out. Maybe some activities. Who knows what's coming up? You never know. This panel is wild and crazy. So um, today we're going to be using the hashtag use social, and I encourage you to tweet your questions. I'm going to be monitoring the airwaves um, along with uh, some friends in the audience, including um, Annalisa in the back. I'm sure Susan will be tweeting as well. Um, and we encourage you to put your questions in that way. Um, we'll, we'll be monitoring the airwaves. And the way that we're going to do it today is we're going to start with the um, ladies from D.C. to talk about marketing plus education equals new social. Um, and then they're going to do a 20-minute presentation, and then we'll do 10 minutes q um, And then we'll go to Allie Burness to talk about the body critical and museum selfies. And then we're going to end up with a little bit more um, administrative, which is organizing social media managers and what that looks like in the back end. Um, with Brian Dodge from Toronto and Larry uh, Bird Phillips uh, from the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. So um, my Twitter handle is Museum of Emily. Um, you can uh, tweet directly at me or use the hashtag. And uh, please feel free to engage in the conversation after these guys get started. So first up. Oh, one more thing. I also wanted to remind you guys to please think about joining the um, social media special interest group, uh, which was started and they'll be talking about today, Lori and Ryan, but it's specifically for people who are managing social media and we encourage you to get involved and join that. Hi, I'm Dana Allen Will. I'm here. Margaret and Megan will introduce themselves. We're going to kind of tag team in the next 20 minutes. Um, and our topic is where the magic happens when marketing education together with the students. And I think the idea for this team out of three of us all work in education departments and museums. I'm curious, first of all, how many of you manage social media for your students? Okay, that's beautiful. And how many of you are in an education? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we think it's a little bit unique, and we wanted to kind of share the perspective of what that means for social media coming out of a place of education. That's right. And these were our guiding questions, and we're going to kind of organize what we're talking about based around these three questions. So, one, what is the core purpose of social media in a cultural institution? We could have had a whole conference about that question, so we'll just be barely scratching the surface. Um, how can we best connect with audiences online? Again, coming out of this place of thinking about it from an educational standpoint. And how can we go beyond mere promotion to foster personal connection, deepen learning, and create meaningful engagement with audiences? So, here we go with question one. So, hi, I'm Megan Eastep. I'm the manager of K 12 Digital and Educator <coughs> Initiatives, the longest title ever, at Phelps Fashion in Washington, D.C. Has anyone ever been to the Phelps? Uh, so, like Dana said, we have three guiding questions. Our first is, what is the core purpose of social media in cultural institutions? And obviously, this is different for a marketing department or a communications department versus education. This is the Phillips on Twitter. This is our social identity from our marketing and communications department. Um, obviously, you can see our visual identity. You can see how we tweet. And Margaret, neither Margaret or I are social media managers. We work in education, as like Dana said. And we're just both very interested in learning how to engage with our audiences in a meaningful way beyond the people who come into our museum's doors. Um, so what we've done is we're going to share with you two initiatives that um, have built social media into what we do as educators. Um, I'm Margaret Sternberg, and I am the manager of digital and gallery communication at the Post Collection. Um, and one thing I want to emphasize with um, the initiative that Megan and I will be talking about 
is um, we have the core mission of our institution at the core of both of these initiatives. And we're really, I think we're really fortunate that our mission is to be an intimate museum combined with an experience state. So everything we do in the galleries or online, we really focus on fostering personal connections and also um, challenging ourselves to experiment and in some cases have less than impressive <coughs> results. But I don't necessarily think that means that you're failing. So um, one of the uh, things we're going to highlight today is um, Break for Art. Has anyone ever participated in Break for Art? Yeah. 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 Um, Break for Art is our monthly Twitter chat that we launched um, about a year and a half ago. And we were seeking to find a way to take a drop-in, inquiry-based tour that takes place at our museum every Tuesday through mm -hmm. Friday at noon and focuses on one work of art in our permanent collection um, and expanded to an online audience. So we thought we would experiment with doing a weekly Twitter, weekly Twitter chat. Um, and it uh, started weekly at noon, and we shifted it to a monthly basis. I can talk more about that later. Um, but it really focuses on inquiry-based learning strategies, which are um, asking questions to foster personal connections versus pushing out facts um, about um, a work of art or an artist. We also collaborated with our communications team to really make sure that we were um, focusing on institutional voice and branding so this wasn't a one-off thing using the Phillips Collections handle in a way that um, didn't make sense within our um, institutional way. So the other initiative that I'll be talking about is um, creating social media for a specific audience. And what I've done is, um, in collaboration with communication and some of my education colleagues, is put our methodology for teaching with arts integration, which we call PRISM K-12, um, online. And so we've created a website for teachers, not me, I know that. Um, and we've started to create a community for our educators on Twitter and on Pinterest. And we launched this in January of 2014. Um, and it's built basically for classroom and art teachers who are interested in teaching with arts integration, weaving together core subjects and the arts. And these places, Twitter and Pinterest, are really supposed to be um, a place to create conversation for our educators and um, a place and a dedicated space for them to feel community. Um, so what we did is, I'm going to read you our intended goal, um, which is long, so I don't have it memorized. Uh, but I work in collaboration with social, with our social media team to create this. And it's that K-12 teachers will seek out Phillips or Prism K-12 as a leader in arts integration, teachers will use our social media as a place to create conversation and share back arts integrated lesson ideas. <coughs> and teachers feel personal connection to the Phillips as an institution and feel confident in teaching with arts integration in their classrooms. So we really built our strategy around those ideas. We looked at assets, we looked at objectives. And so what I'm going to talk about um, throughout the presentation is why we've done this and really how we're sort of dancing the fine line between promoting our ideas and actually creating a good conversation. A little bit of background on how I came to be managing social media at the National Gallery. It actually used to be run by the press office and as part of kind of a larger looking at how digital was run at the National Gallery of Art, I was asked to kind of uh, Propose how I would imagine social media could work at the National Gallery uh, because I had managed social media for other institutions before coming there. And this is a statement that I wrote as part of that kind of initial proposal, and it's not an officially adopted um, strategy, but it's something I try to keep in mind. And really, the social media um, people is basically me. Allie Burnett was interning with us for um, several months, and she was. Uh, and then anybody else who aren't able to kind of recruit from around the institution to volunteer their time. So it's really basically me. So to me, the fact that I have this in my head, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the intended impact uh, would be that more people personally experience the transformative power of art and appreciate the role of the gallery in preserving and promoting the nation's art collection. So I think you'll see here uh, that there is both an aspect of promotion and education. To bring those together. Um, and also, really thinking about the fact that our social media audiences are international. In fact, I think uh, less than a quarter, depending on the platform you're looking at, are local. 
Um, so we're really thinking as of social media as a platform outside of the community. And these are the intended outcomes again from that same document um, before I took it over. And here I've highlighted the elements that I believe kind of uh, are about outreach. So new audiences, existing fans, and art enthusiasts, online audiences, which are, to be frank, not often thought of as kind of individuals outside of producer um, in terms of foot traffic, people are always thinking about the visitor on site, and I'm often thinking about um, all those other people out there who care about it. So even just saying online audiences is something that I think needs kind of further definition and the underlines that that is an audience, it is a diverse audience of many kinds of people or many different people. Um, and then here's the education part. So they're drawn in more deeply, and more often they're becoming part of their daily lives, um, they're gaining a better understanding of works of art. They're feeling connected to us and they're feeling part of the connection. So these are aspirational. I'm not saying that we're meeting all of these goals for outcomes, but this is uh, what I hope that we can accomplish. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today are instances. We've only done two of them, pretty new for us. Um, and again, for context, I'm at the National Gallery of Art. I, I propose that we have an Instagram account about 18 months before actually it was approved. So things don't move very quickly, um, and that's the context that I'm in. So the fact that we've done two institutes this year is really exciting, and I think we're looking at them out of experiment figuring out what works best for us. Um, we did one in June, and one in October. The one in June was um, designed I think I was still thinking with a promotional hack a little bit, to be honest. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later about how paid ups work for us. But we are currently renovating our East Building, which is our modern art building. And most people think it's closed. Well, the locals think it's closed, and there's a big sign that says we're renovating. Um, and most of the galleries are actually closed. But there is sculpture on the field. And so we've introduced a new tour to get people to come in um, and interact in a kind of different way from our traditional tours and conversations. This is things that other museums have been doing for quite some time, but it's sort of unique to us. So the idea was to get people in and kind of model that while they're also so it was a very highly structured, um, there was content delivery and then activities kind of throughout. And the second one that we did, the pendulum kind of swung all the way in the other direction based on feedback. Uh, where we had no content delivery, it was all just, here, we're giving you six prompts, tear up, go out, and do this thing, and in an hour we'll get together and have lunch and talk about it. So that's what I will be talking about. <laughs> um, so our second guiding question um, has to do with the best way to connect with a variety of audiences online. And um, what I want to talk a bit about is how we're comparing our break for art audience with our everyday walking visitor. And we found that with a drop-in inquiry-based tour, um, we could have kind of an anecdotal understanding of who was coming, how many people, kind of their age ranges, what kind of questions they were asking, um, a little bit about their demographics just based on observation. Um, but with a rate for our audience, it was really hard to really figure out who exactly they were beyond their photo and their um, handle. So we um, actually did a survey of our active participants, those are people who were actively tweeting at us um, or using the Bridgeport hashtag. Um, and we uh, tweeted at them and went to a survey um, after about a year of doing this. And we were really fortunate that we were also doing a year long visitor study in the museum. So we modeled the questions um, for the Twitter survey after those questions so that we had incredible data, which has been incredibly valuable. Um, there was a range of questions, including the codes and other demographic information, but I want to focus just on three areas that I think illustrate how we're reaching a different audience with this Twitter chat. Um, and I love data, so I grasp. Yes. Um, so the first question is about how old you are, and the green um, bars represent the break for art participant. And um, you can see that it's skewing towards the 20 and 30 year old um, categories which is not surprising because that is probably more the typical age of a Twitter user. Um, but it really validated to us that we were reaching a different segment of um, the uh, person interested in the Phillips collection because 
there's such a dramatic difference between the ages of these two groups. Um, the next thing we asked was how often you visited the ghost collection in the past year. And the, um, the walk-in visitor that we surveyed obviously had visited these once because they were there. Um, but the largest segment of our break for our participants had never been to the Phillips in the past year. Only 32% or 32 of them had never been to the Phillips in the past year. So we were hitting people that either couldn't come to our institution or just hadn't bothered coming. Um, we followed this up with how often do you visit a museum or other cultural institution? And surprisingly, the break for art audience, um, overwhelmingly, 75% of them visit a museum or cultural institution uh, once a month once a month or more, where our walk-in audience, um, that speed down a little bit. So you're hitting uh, an audience that is younger, not likely to come to Phillips, but was still very culturally engaged. Um, so this gave us a lot of information that we, we use to kind of tweak break for a little bit, and it gives us a picture of who this person is on the other end of our screen. So the question is to how you can connect with a variety of audiences, and as I mentioned, our goal for Prism K-12 on social um, dances around sort of enriching K-12 teachers with information, giving them the power to become arts integrators, and um, then building this community. And so my primary goal is quality, not quantity. And I've actually heard this in a lot of other sessions while I've been here, so I'm very excited about that. Um, so I wasn't really worried about building numbers in our first year of life. Um, and you know, it was also great. Um, so what the goal became was building sort of a true community of teachers. And um, so you can see here that in the very small amount of followers we have, I think it's 155, um, <coughs> what we've done is built almost half of them as K-12 educators. Then the other, another third of that is what I'm calling education enthusiasts, people who are either museum educators, colleagues of mine, um, people who are arts advocates, who are interested in learning about arts integration but might not necessarily be teaching in a classroom. And then the last is sort of just this unknown population of people who I just can't, I don't know who they are, they don't have a description, um, they're just there. Which is also fine, they're getting the information no matter what, um, I'm okay with that. And so what we've been doing in order to reach this audience is conducting some experiments with how we are using the PRISM online and how we can engage with our teacher audience. And so what we do know is that teachers don't or cannot access social media during the day based on sometimes school networks. Um, getting on Twitter is impossible for them. So they use it at night, sometimes to recap what goes on during the day, read news, things like that. We know how teachers like to learn. They like to go to professional development events. They like to get art historical information about works of art that they can translate to their classroom. Um, they like to make things. Our teachers love to practice art. Um, and then they also like to talk to their colleagues. They don't sometimes have colleagues to talk to in their school. So they want to get social. They want to talk to each other and share ideas. So we've done a couple of experiments. Um, and what I've learned is that teachers don't know how to use Twitter that well. Um, <laughs> So our first one was with our special exhibition on Van Gogh, and we had a both analog and digital way to reach our teacher group that came. It was a very highly attended um, special exhibition teacher program where we had a panel of experts talking about teaching with Van Gogh. Not all of our teachers were able to tweet in their questions and responses to this panel, so we had a post-it board where they could actually just write down the questions and responses and pass those in. That got a higher response rate than the actual Twitter. I think I have about three. Um, so, for 70 teachers that were there. So, you know, it, it ebbs and flows. Something that ended up working out really well was our second experiment. Um, and this is on Pinterest, where I think more of my audience is going to find a home and be more interested in using. Um, and what we did is, this is our special exhibition directly following Bingo. It's called Made in the USA. Um, it was actually made up of works of art from our permit collection. So we were very lucky in that we were able to photograph in the galleries. And so we wanted to encourage online interaction with our public. Our marketing and communications teams had a couple of different Twitter and Pinterest campaigns on their own. So I sort of rode their coattails and caught on to an institution-wide hashtag that they used, which is My American Art, had my teachers working, a group of dedicated teachers to work with us on Pinterest to share their ideas of how they were teaching with American Art in the classroom and to use the hashtag. It's not radical. But then when you search this hashtag, obviously you're seeing both what teachers are doing in the classroom and what our public is doing to interact with the art. 
So it's a very interesting way. I'm really just starting to see um, engagement from both the everyday visitor and a K-12 teacher. And I think teachers can also get a good appreciation for how you might interact with um, anything through reflection. I'm going to tell you a little story. <laughs> I realized I was talking really fast. <laughs> uh, but this is what I saw when uh, you decided to launch Instagram in the game. Um, a lot of photographs of one particular work of art. How many of you have been to the National Gallery? How many of you have seen this work of art? You know, it really pulls you in. And it actually has its own hashtag that was made up by someone uh, and used lots of times without us having any idea about that because we weren't participating in Instagram at that time. And that is those NGA lights. Um, and so I was seeing this kind of over and over and over again. And there was someone else who was seeing this over and over and over again. And this is Phil Martin. He is an Instagrammer. He lives in D.C. He was born and raised in D.C. And despite being in his ending of uh, has never been to the National Gallery of Art before. And um, that's because he just didn't think it was a place for him. But he kept seeing those photographs and he knew he had to come and see it for himself. So here's a photo of Phil at our first ever Insigne in June. And you can see, if, you know, you can read a lot of data just looking at the photographs you can take in Insigne is data. And their captions are data that you can mine for us. What you're looking for. So he looks engaged to me. He looks very much engaged with this work of art. He is on his knees trying to get a good shot of us. Um, and here's what, so this is, you know, somebody else photographing him taking this photograph. So that's what he produced out of um, that image. Um, and I think we could agree that the very much a work of art in and of itself. So he's creating art in our art museum. Art Watchers is a, is a hashtag that is already popular on Instagram, and we used it as one of our props at our Technic Institute. It basically said, what do people look like when they're looking at art? And here's an example of the kind of image that was produced. You can see here, uh, I want to talk a little bit about who comes to Institute and the ways that they're similar and different. Here's someone using uh, their iPhone. There are a lot of kind of purists um, who will only use their smartphones for Instagram. And then there are others who use cameras. I've seen film cameras, Polaroid cameras. I haven't seen a pinhole camera yet, but you know, maybe <laughs> someday. Um, and there's a lot of things like taking pictures of other people taking pictures, which is always fun. Uh, and here's an example along the top row. This is an Instagrammer who came to our second Instagram and name is Victoria Pickering. She shoots black and white. Uh, and then at the bottom, we've got Rover Cleveland. Uh, and he likes to take detail shots. Neither of these were responding whatsoever to the prompts we gave them. They were doing that own thing. And that's fine. And I think that's what we're what I'm trying to kind of um, work on with our education team. That our expected outcomes are not always what we're gonna get, and that we will be learning a lot through this process. Um, here's another way that uh, who comes to our institute is very different. The makeup is very different from what what we typically see on the left is the typical tour, the National Gallery of Art, and on the right are the people who came to our first meeting. When people saw this photo, they were really excited. Um, people, meaning uh, people who work for our institutions, were like, that is the audience that we've been trying to get in here. Uh, and so, we're going to do more institutes <laughs> to keep bringing these people in. Um, oh, and there's Bill. And we came to our first and our second in Sydney. And then I noticed as I was working on my presentation just a few days ago that he posted this photo just uh, on Wednesday and it says, TBT, the first time seeing those NBA lights. And to me, this warmed my heart because you only TBT or throw that Thursday to things that are actually going to look to you. And so this was, um, this made me very happy. <laughs> um, so our third guiding question has to do with. Um, this idea of being promotional versus fostering personal connections, deep in learning, and creating meaningful experiences through social media. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about this idea of quantity versus quality that Megan brought up. And I think, um, and I'm not in social media, and everyone here seems like they are, so 
I'm not super familiar with the term, so please forgive me if I screw up. But um, I asked our marketing department how they were measuring our engagement using Break for Art. And they shared with me, um, I was on the phone with myself, but they shared with me the things they were measuring. They were measuring um, our impressions, the number of times Break for Art was seen on Twitter, and it's 17,000 um, per chat, which I don't know if that's really bad. Um, 228 engagements, that's the number of times a user has interacted with a tweet and some other metrics they were using. And as a museum educator, I was having a hard time understanding if we were really engaging with the people we were um, seeking to engage with. So I started manually counting things. Um, and I gave up frequently, because it's hard. Um, I was counting the number of participants that were actively tweeting during a session. Um, and I had some support from one of our fabulous interns. And we found that we ranged from four to 16 people who were actively engaged with answering, responding to, using our hashtag. It averaged about them, which might be unimpressive. It was manageable for us, because it was either me or Megan uh, managing the tweet, or the um, chat. Um, then I thought, well, when we have a tour, we don't just count the people who are talking on the tour, we count people who are physically there, who might be having a side conversation, who might just be nodding. Um, so I started trying to count manually, because we didn't have any of the social media metrics. Um, that you can subscribe to, um, people who were retweeting and favoring, and I quickly gave up. <laughs> so there's question marks. And then I started wondering about these people who were lurking, who maybe were just following the chat and enjoying it, but not giving us any indication that they were participating. So I decided that some of these traditional metrics were not really helpful, and I started digging deeper and looking at the chats themselves, and scrolling through a year-long history of um, some of the questions we were asking. So I want to highlight a few of them. Um, the first is a work by um, Stuart Davis, um, called Blue Cafe, and we asked people what they might hear on the street corner, and one of our participants um, referenced um, the movie Midnight Met in Paris, and how she, there's a scene where a car comes barreling around the bend, and the main characters jump out and run into a jazz cafe. And in a gallery setting, she might have brought that up, but no one in the gallery, if you were in the tour and didn't know what that reference was, um, you'd be kind of excluded from the conversation. But she shared with us a screenshot, we were able to share that with her followers, and it created this great, rich multimedia experience um, through this chat. Mm -hmm. Similarly, we talked about this work by Georgia O'Keefe, My Shanty, Make George. And this conversation really focused on the personal connections that Georgia O'Keefe had to this um, shanty. It was her art studio um, in this place, Lake George. And um, one of our participants from Nova Scotia asked if this was Lake George, Nova Scotia. And I had no idea where that was. I was Googling it. I had no idea how to bring this into the conversation. And then he tweeted a photo, a personal photo, that resonates immediately visually. And he tweeted at us, not using the hashtag, and we were able to push it back out using the hashtag and share with people this personal connection with this name. Um, finally, the chat also allows us to um, add different layers of multimedia. And we talked about this work by William Merritt Chase called Hide and Seek. And we asked people what music they would hear with soundtrack. And we got a lot of great responses, including the Jaws soundtrack track, um, <laughs> in the Hall of the Mountain Kings, and um, the soundtrack from Gosford Park. And again, if you were in a gallery setting, there'd be no way for us to draw in these connections in a way that was more democratic and that everyone could um, equally appreciate them. But instead, we were able to, every time someone referenced it, we found something on YouTube, threw it into a tweet, and people could experience this rich multimedia um, uh, chat. Um, finally, I want to highlight one last thing. Um, this was a Twitter chat we did with an artist from the Wolf Trap Center for the Performing Arts, um, which is just outside DC. They perform at the Phillips every year, um, singers from their opera house, uh, take works of art in our collection, and pair them with. Songs and uh, Tracy Cox paired this work um, by John Barry with a song called Neurotic and Lonely, which is a song that uses a Craigslist personal ad um, as the lyrics. So it's really funny. And I wish I could have played it here, but we didn't have enough time. And uh, we were able to tweet out a video of her practicing the song during rehearsal, and then she comes up and chat with us, creating um, this, again, a really rich level of engagement, reaching all her followers. And it had a little bit of a promotional element in that um, it was highlighting an event that was taking place at the Phillips collection, which ended up being sold out. So there's a lot of different layers um, to that. Um, 
we're really going to break it up with the same here. Um, what I'm starting to see in regards to this third question about promotion versus deep engagement is a struggle for myself in terms of how, what type of information I'm pushing out to our teachers, what, how am I building this audience to um, get deep engagement. And so what we have is we share information about holding professional developments for teachers. The Phillips tweets out um, links to our website and we shout it out during break for art. But really, I, I want to get this, this is a group of teachers in our galleries looking deeply, doing an activity, learning about how to use arts integration for their classrooms. So my goal is to get this online um, so start thinking about that, and then let me know. I think since we're running out of time, I'm going to take my last couple slides and say them very quickly, and I think we'll probably have to engage with you in the quarter, and I apologize for that, but I want to be conscious of our other So, to me, this is what we like to look like. Lots of people kind of uh, repeating whatever your expert says, and it's really great for promotion. Uh, to me, these are kind of what instincts look like. I don't specifically <laughs> figure out the metaphor, but it's either like a kaleidoscope or some kind of play of spaghetti maker. In that, everybody kind of does their own thing. Like, yeah, it's really interesting, but it's not like a point to one to see your message out there. Here's an example of what we see in the art at one of our instincts. People doing selfies. Um, this is just an example of the kind of evaluation we're doing. We're keeping it very this is what I send out after the event, and I want it to be very explicit that um, it's not disturbing, it's going to go on to, you know, get downloaded on somebody's hard drive somewhere. That it really helps me justify doing more things if you like it, so tell me that. And if you don't like it, help me shape our future strategy. And I got super meaningful responses to the kinds of questions that I tend to ask people, but not as a survey, just as an email, personal email from me. And I got really long, thoughtful. Responses. Here's an example. Um, I love when we broke up into teams near the end of producing creative response. We asked them to look at this work of art and then work together on the creative response. You know, they really like those hands on challenges. Here is the, what they came up with. They put all their phones to Instagram, put them in a circle, kind of imitating that work of art. Um, and this activity is actually what influenced us for our second meet, being uh, just basically prompts working together so people really told us that they liked working. Um, here's an example of the kind of email I got back. It's a lot of really rich, fantastic feedback. And over and over, uh, I kind of heard it's too structured. The first one was too structured, so we went to something very unstructured. The second one was not very good. Too much structured, so we're taking that balance out. And then over and over, we get a lot behind the scenes access. We want special, we want something special that not everybody else gets. So not everybody talks us that, but we hear that in the most often. I just want to say we could have a whole conversation about empty net, but essentially that was a private access event that was super successful, got them tons of followers, and now it's not going to be an empty We'll talk about more about why later if you see tomorrow. Um, this is one of my favorite images from the second me, showing um, how people felt a new connection and understanding of the work of our time body. We've seen this in other uh, that people really love doing that. Um, and finally, just to say, in terms of audience, it's really interesting to me, these are museum professionals and then our second and to me, I want to say half of the people who came were other museum professionals trying to figure out how to run the museum at their museum. And I was like, oh, this is only our second one. Please don't be first as a model yet. <laughs> um, but they also come up with really fun. Uh, the person wearing the hat earlier was also a museum professional. Here are uh, People from the National Archives who came over and they used their National Archives account. They're saying your National Archives is going to be a team like down the street at the National Gallery today. Um, and last slide, this is the only, only image that Phil Martin took in the second to me. Again, it's nothing to do with the complication, but it says she just went over devastated by art. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this presentation is based on some graduate research, 
So if you do, you can do it. Hey, then, the last presentation. I've also had a scheduled tweet that I was going to get to early, but that will be useful a bit later on in my presentation. So it would be worth doing that to have a look at that. So I've been running the museum Southeast Canada since May last year. It was a side project for my year of traveling. And very early into the travels, I couldn't help noticing this way of using the museum and wondered what on earth was going on. Uh, if this was a new way of using the museum space, I wanted to try to understand it. So fast forward to 2014, I'm now one of many people around the world researching stuff. These researchers create a group called the Selfie Researchers Network, who have even created a university level class and syllabus. So I've just completed master's research on, based on this topic. So I looked into the relevant bodies of theory around these images identity theory and visit experience, social media and photography, and performance in the museum. I found strong visual evidence for each. In this presentation, I'll outline these key areas and explain how they're relevant to museum selfies. But first, a confession. Despite my theorizing, museum selfies are so much fun. I find editing the Tumblr endlessly funny and beautiful, and I'm often impressed by the creativity that visually conveys in selfies. I also think these super fun photos hold insight into what our visitors are doing in the museum. If we combine the museum, photography, and some key ideas, key ideas in identity theory, performance in the everyday museum visit comes to the fore. And so I come to think of museum studies as mental performative acts of identity work. I also think museum selfies are evidence of the personal meaning making process conducted by visitors as they move their lives into the museum. So if we choose to dig deeper into museum selfies, it's important we have a useful understanding of identity and how it might work. In a recent piece of writing, I briefly outlined two general schools of thought about this, and I tweeted a bit to that earlier. The first is a popular idea about identity as the authentic essential self that sits within us, at the traditional notion of the soul. And in this idea, the self remains constant and the same. This is an idea I don't necessarily agree with, but as I unpack it, you'll start to recognize how it manifests in the media. So from the authentic essential self, the presentation of the self online has a fractional effect. Online spaces draw us away from this essential truth of inside us, by requiring us to present ourselves in multiple ways across multiple platforms. The idea of being cognitively absent from our physical space when online also emerges. And this is where digital dualism comes in, as in the physical versus the digital as separate spaces. The idea of the physical being more real than the digital. So taking selfies disrupts real moments in our lives by encouraging us to capture and share ourselves self-consciously to online audiences. Another school of thought about identity hinges around performance. This idea understands it as something that is constantly changing, continuously being constructed through our performance of everyday life. This logic of performance encompasses both our physical and digital lives. I think this idea gives us a more constructive base from which to gain insight. The online space amplifies the self-conscious day-to-day methods of identity construction that we all use for the navigable in our world. Selfies so are one way in which the performance in everyday life is made explicit. A specific point of identity theory that I like is made by Stuart Hall. He talks about identity as points of suture, in which we as individuals agree to invest in a social discourse of the black institution, such as our museum. This mutual agreement to invest in an identity position is temporary. I think the museum selfie lets us see that temporary moment in which an identity is stitched together between a museum and an individual. 
A number of researchers have found identity to be important in museum experience. John Ford outlines five visiting motivations based on identity. Ford <coughs> has looked into the role of identity in different types of learning experiences in museums. And Jane Brown has suggested that identity work is the primary influencer in how visitors look and learn. So, moving on to photography, this encompasses social media so much. So, these are a vernacular photography practice. They didn't emerge from institutions, and despite Joe Salt attempting to find an art photography image, they didn't come from that historical movement. So, these are brought into museums by visitors. So, anyone here or following the social tag knows that images are the currency of the internet and have become a method of communication. The medium is my message. I would say beyond that, social photography is a way of being in the moment. And here I'll quote from a theorist called Nathan Jacobson. Social photography should be understood not as a remove from the moment, but a deeply social immersion. Selfies largely are not recording the exception where events we face people they exactly the the everyday moments that move the fabric of life in all its variety. Across all the images that make their way to my camera, selfies with famous objects are not the majority. From the thousands of images I've seen, I'll say that the Mona Lisa argument against selfies is an illusion. The bulk of these images are created, humanized kinds of beautiful, often with less known works obscure architectural spaces. Museum selfies are sharing the moments that move the fabric of the visual experience in all of its variety. Nowadays, the role of photography in the age of social media is less about learning and more about identity. And bring your mind back to performance again. Photos are an integral part of us performing our identity today, and selfies are especially so. We perform as we pose, we perform as we take a photo, and we perform as we put that photo into social spaces. In this way, they are less, they are less photographed and more like a speech act. And by this I mean much more than a photograph itself. I'm talking about the whole part and parcel of the selfie, including the posing, the intent, the editing, the insertion of social media, the commenting, the writing. So there's a lot more of a selfie than a photograph. <coughs> so, for better or worse, implicitly or explicitly, whether we like or not, we lose our performance spaces. The dominance of storytelling and narrative, some argue at the expense of the materiality of objects, speaks to this paternity of ideology. I'm not just talking about museums as self-aware institutions. I think we can argue that visitors are aware of their central role in the display process. The museum selfie is a glimpse into the actions and performances which create museums. In addition to this, museum selfies showcase personal experiences with objects. A feature of museums which is usually sidelined in favor of professional insights of the curator, director, or artist. Personal stories have been proven to play a role in the meaning of the process, including identity motivation, emotion, imagination, biographical stories. These images let us see the moment when a visitor weaves their own personal story around, into, or onto an object. It shows them applying the language of their own experience, not necessarily the interpretation which may or may not be provided. We could say that visitor photography and museum selfies are an indicator of how dominant the visitor is at making the museum. So to summarize, summarize to this point, I think we can now see why I think the museum selfies are making the kind of acts of identity work. Because all three primary components, identity, photography, and the museum are inherently performative. The museum selfies are concentration. So I have a group of examples to show you, and the map is not recognizable, so in here. And 
then Rao cycles through So a distinctive feature of the selfie is the moved gaze. And this refers to the gaze of the selfie taker meeting the gaze of the selfie viewer. This is key to the consent to parent the selfie. The photographer gives permission to the viewer to look and implies a return of that look. And in this way, the selfie communicates communal looking and self-awareness. And this is amplified by the presence of social media. Whether we are subjects of selfies or looking at them, we are all looking at each other. There are many museum selfies which don't show the selfie taker's face as well, and where the selfie taker is exerting their directorial control and deliberately complicated that So next I'll talk about the body, which is an article distinguishing feature of museum selfies, the relationship and interaction between the museum space and objects and the body of the selfie. Selfies and museum selfies, particularly, are not about faces, they're about bodies and what they do. I think it's interesting to note that in museum spaces, visitor bodies and behaviors are supervised and controlled, there's explicit and implicit rules about how visitors behave and what visitors do. And since the dawn of museums, there's been a debate around who and how certain bodies are present in museums today. And I think Portia Moore's research speaks directly to that. Visitors can take back some control over the museum experience by taking a selfie, and sometimes use selfies to push the doors. And there's a selfie in this group as well, which I'll just give a bit of So just to end, I thought I'd talk about the next steps I see for this research. Some commercial organizations are scraping selfies for information. Companies are determining dominant emotions associated with the brand, or products that create links between brands uh, and finding demographic types for those who consume their products. But museums have visitors who share their selfies with us. Selfies are a right source of data about what our visitors are doing in museum spaces. I know I can see evidence of all five of John Ford's digital motivation segments in the museum selfies I see. I think museum selfies could be a fantastic data source which could form the core of an audience evaluation framework. There's something visitors leave behind and they show what visitors do in museums. There are the two types of evaluated data that we try to collect in other with other ways, such as observation and with surveys or response areas. The remaining element, what selfie takers say, could be purchased from the interview stage of this. I think a framework could be created, produced by museum staff to get their insights from these images to the next day. was about friction between collection management and photography by visitors and museums. So are you you're referring to managing the collection at the time? So two things. We're sort of talking about there isn't much room area. So we want to check if we're not allowed to have a and we will be able to check that we can go back up here. Yeah. So that's one Part of that question uh, was based in historic so houses, which can find spaces in the world that people want to pay any attention to. Taking a photograph and step back and hit an object. Actually, I went to what could be considered a, a cramped historic house museum recently, uh, and, and the photography was allowed. 
really explicitly strong in Japanese American photography. And I was fascinated because the majority of the people who were there were on audio guides, and they seemed quite unaware of their own physical behavior. And that was crazy. I thought it was interesting that they hadn't compared that to the behaviors around photography as well. Copyright, I'm less experienced in, I can possibly not the best person to talk about that. Um, yeah. Um, you know, 
it sounds strange that people who are supposed to be uber connected could feel isolated in their work, but sometimes we do feel really alone. So, you know, coming out of the conference last year, we thought, wouldn't it be great if we could all gather together and really and really come together as a community? So that's why we why we did it. And like Laurie said, uh, the group quickly grew when we first started, and we really kind of just let it happen. We we tried to ensure that people. Uh, introduced themselves in the group so we knew who they were and where they were from. But, you know, a, like a month in, we were just adding new members all the time and it kind of, kind of, we lost that. And, but what quickly happened was this real sense of community and this real sense of sharing in, in the group. And, you know, you see lots of posts every day about tons of different uh, uh, themes in, in our work in our day to day. And it's, it's been a really great sounding board for sharing. Uh, questions and, and campaigns and failures and, and things like that. So um, I've done a little bit of sifting through the thousands of posts, so I'm just going to give you an idea of some of the three top themes that we see um, in the group that we talk about. And the big one is user-generated content in gallery or in the museum and how to bring that those digital conversations and content into the physical museum. There's a lot of people that are in this group that have uh, incredible amounts of experience in this, and there's a lot that are just getting started with this. So it's great to see that contrast. And personally, I keep an eye on these posts uh, all the time because you can always learn something new from this. Some people will try the same things and have different results. Others will try something completely different and have the same results. So it's, it's really interesting to see how that, how that works. The other big one is to advertise or not to advertise. Page posts, page tweets, that sort of thing. Um, again, Usually you can find someone in the group that's tried it all um, and someone who's just getting started with this. And the reality is for a lot of us, this is going to be a big thing going forward. So it's always nice to be able to, to air some of your frustrations, but also, um, you know, <laughs> with having to, having to do a post, but also talk about, um, you know, what other you, others have tried so that you're not wasting your money and your time on this kind of stuff. And then we talk about new platforms all the time. Um, you know, uh, uh, there was a big hello frenzy a couple of months ago, and then um, when Hyperallergic did that, did that uh, story about um, Snapchat, there was, a, there was a big talk about that. And I find it really interesting that um, when we have the conversations about why people choose to use these new tools and why they don't, and when they talk about the different de demographics involved in, the, in their community and, and how that uh, informs their decision to use these new tools. So for me, that's a, that's a really great one. And then this, the, one of the big things that I'm, we're really happy that, that uh, came about was the international collaboration on campaigns. So we're not taking credit by any means for Ask a Curator. It started a long time ago, but last year was the first time that there was a group of us behind the scenes that were talking about how we were going to use the day to highlight what we were doing in our institutions and how we were going to support each other in this endeavor. And yeah, the formatting changed. But anyway, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's many in the room that have taken part in this throughout the years. Um, this year, the activity was was way bigger than it was in years past. So, um, you know, like I said, we're not taking credit, but you know, it's it's. It's been great to have that camaraderie and that collaboration behind the scenes so that everyone is prepared for these days when they come about. Some of the other, um, uh, yeah, some of the other um, uh, international campaigns, um, I remember there was a conversation about Museum Selfie Day and whether there was an S on the end of Museum Selfie or, <laughs> you know, there was, we talked about that for a while. Just one more. Yeah, you know, Museum Week, uh, Museum Cats was a big one, um, uh, and Insta Museum was also a really big one. Um, you know, I think, uh, I don't have the stats from last year, but I think there were around 600 museums that took part in as curator. so anyway, just, just an example. On a personal level, um, we also have the opportunity to share our own campaigns. Um, uh, this year, it's the 100th anniversary of, of the Royal Ontario Museum. And uh, I was able to ask people to give us a shout out on our birthday, March 19th. And March 19th goes down as a record day for us on social media. It's by far our most active day. Uh, we trended in Toronto and Canada for a little over eight hours um, from just before 9 a.m. till after 6. So 
it was really great um, to have the support of the community. And, and you know, all I did was say, if you have some time, if you think you can work it in your day, just say happy birthday. That'd be great. Thanks. So thank you to everyone that did that. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I missed the format again, but um, we had some we had some really great reach on that. Um, our engagement rate was over eight percent, which was fantastic. It's really hard to get a really high engagement rate on Twitter. So um, you know, thanks again for that. And I want to report that my son shares a birthday with Rom. Um, so, I also saw incredible support from the group for a campaign I ran for the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. And we're the largest children's museum in the world, so we have fun things like dinosaurs. And our uh, really popular Dinosphere exhibit was celebrating its 10th birthday this year, also, also in March. Um, and so, what we did is we put out a call to the group to help us on, um, help us literally hashtag party like a dino on a single day in March by virtually gifting Dinosphere presents or greetings in whatever way would relate to that museum. Um, and we were really astounded by the response. Um, so museums created memes, Photoshop greetings, gifts, um, thoughtful gifts from their collection. And um, it was ultimately 30 organizations that participated across six countries, giving gifts in, um, and greetings in four languages. And the Party Like a Dino hashtag received 355 mentions from the only 200 users, which we were really not anticipating. We're not, we're not the problem. So we weren't <laughs> anticipating that. And we were really excited by the response. Um, but ultimately, um, I really feel like, as Ryan mentioned, these collaborative social campaigns like Task Week Curator and others, coordinated by culture themes, they show that when museums work together, we're really a force to be reckoned with. Um, but it's even more impressive when other museums are gracious enough to do this for individual museums. Like, that just is what blows me away. So I hope that campaigns like this can inspire even more celebrations and successes in the future. Um, we kind of were bold in making the ask the Brown and the Children's Museum, but we really want to see more museums making requests like this because we really all need content, um, especially on Twitter. Like, people aren't getting flooded on Twitter. So it, it really doesn't take much to send out a tweet congratulating someone about something or supporting a campaign you can do a lot more that. So, um, oh good. This one's good. <laughs> we asked others in the group to share what they felt to be valuable, unique, or surprising about our community. And here are some of the responses. Um, the two members shared that this group actually inspired them to create similar groups for their own more specific communities, including Chad at um, Balbo, Balbo Park Online Collaborative, where they have a group that helps all the Balbo Park Museum social media managers collaborate. And um, Anna, Anna from the State Historical Museum in St. Petersburg, she created a group for Russian Museum social media managers. So it's great that this idea is taking off in this space. There were, of course, a whole lot of mentions about just the value of sharing ideas and resources and inspiring one another just to think bigger, to think outside the box. And specifically, there's a lot of value in just really having so many of us in one place to ask a question and get answers from so many perspectives, and that's what we're going to do. Most importantly, though, the level of support and camaraderie that's been established is really, um, again, so impressive. As one member said, this group is a constant reminder that we aren't alone out there. So I'd say that that may be something complicated. Yeah,
like do run is to meet stuff and I'm like I'm I'm drowning in the day to day publishing of content and monitoring. So I call it being on the treadmill. Like you're not you're
Uh, oh, there you are. You're hiding. Um, so the question is that she would love to hear how social media managers are collaborating with other departments. I think you guys talked about that specifically at the beginning, but can you guys talk about how you're working across the institution? Anybody? Um, sorry, I'm talking to you. Um, we're just talking about this at the social media sync function too. Um, one thing that we do is we actually have a content crew um, where our core content crew is our, all the people that need and want content around the museum. So our PR team, social media team, web team, and then our um, hard copy magazine editor. Um, and we have an email where anyone around the museum um, runs, which means you can't have your phone out here and interpret it out on the floor as much. But Anyone, if they catch a moment, they can email it to content at Children's Museum and we'll all uh, get it and be able to do that with it. Um, and that has really helped us. So we meet once a month, but then uh, for about six months, we meet with about 30 people around the museum that are all content stakeholders in them. Um, and we just really um, kind of cultivate them and, and say, you know, like we value everything you're creating and we want to repurpose it in these ways. Let's have this big brainstorm session. And that often helps us fill in content for the whole rest of our six months. Um, and so that's a big way that we've been reaching across our departments and we make a lot of buttons <laughs> to express our things. But I do not have a reputation for I do have a few social media buttons left. Not very many, please tell us more. But um so yeah that's one way is our content grew and that's been years and years and years more close to that relationship across the board. I love that idea in relation to, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Carolyn Royston's Computer Club, and thinking about that in relation to this sort of um, online engagement uh, model, and, and how you can get the entire museum involved. Um, we do something very similar, we actually call it the Social Media Collaborative. Um, I was originally going to call it committee, but I thought collaborative really embodied what I wanted people to do, and I'm not going to say that it's really there yet, but it's not something, honestly, that seems to happen in the lot the National Gallery, bringing people from all over. Um, I think we now have almost 30 people also coming to that. Mostly junior staff representing their departments, but it includes, you know, horticulture, the shops, various editorial departments. Um, and we kind of brainstorm. So we're going to talk about, like, okay, we want to do takeovers of our Instagram accounts. We you know that we need great takeovers of Instagram accounts? So a lot of it's been kind of idea that is to add your to me. And now I'm trying to turn that more into, okay, now you all have to write me at least one for a month. And I get composed. That's 15 days that I can kind of think about what other posts that day. And I think it just keeps growing because people are telling others about it. We're telling them, oh, you know, you should add. And I think thinking about how to make that a working group and keep it small enough that people are actually contributing, but also having principles kind of out various places. It's a trick that I haven't really figured out yet, but having that kind of monthly meeting is super valuable. Um, I, I've been at the wrong for about eight years and only doing social uh, for the last two. And before I was doing social, I worked in the library and archives. And all the curatorial staff would come in and, and ask me to find them stuff, um, help them with their research. So I got to know basically everyone on the curatorial side. And before that, I managed the people on the front desk. So everyone that came through the door, all the staff, I get to know all of those people. So I'm really lucky, and I think it's one of the main reasons I got the job at the ROM, because I already knew everyone. So um, I didn't have to spend time when I first started doing social, building those relationships with people in the institution. I already knew everyone. So when I went to ask them for something to, to use on social, to do something with social, they were kind of like, okay, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll try it. You know, they were very, they were very easy on me the first uh, few months. And then after about a year, we started up doing the monthly sessions again. Um, we had been doing them, but we we took a couple years off. Um, and so we stole Lori's idea of handing out buttons um, at the end. And so we do a quick 10, 15 minute session on one specific thing, like tagging photos with accounts on Twitter, or adding multiple photos to a tweet, or something really, really specific. And then we let the audience sort of, and we chat. We don't really, it becomes less like a like a, a training session or a presentation, and more like a discussion. And then I say five minutes at the end to give people a button. And I usually look through all of the personal activity that happens throughout the month, and I find 
a really good piece of content or something, and I show people this is all it takes. And then I get the person to talk about what they did, whether it was taking a picture of something and how they, or the, the, the great conversation that they had with someone or something like that, and then I give them a little button. So, um, you know, big prize or the big fancy, yeah, uh, like spinning prize slide. Don't underestimate the power of buttons. Buttons are, yeah. <laughs>
years ago, there was no really one person managing it, and we were tweeting sporadically. It was very marketing focused. There was no dialogue with anyone. We weren't responding to anyone. We weren't engaging with anyone on it. It was just, it was really crap. And when I, I'll be honest, and when I took over, um, one of the main things that, uh, first things I did was try to develop how we were going to act on social. So I took over in July, and this was in 2012, and London Olympics um, uh, were coming about, I think it was in August or something, and, and there was a Museum Olympics thing going on, I don't know if you guys remember that. And so, you know, I was like, let's, you know, let's switch it up, let's do something different, let's be funny. And everyone's kind of like, oh. <laughs> so one night, I took a picture of our T-Rex, and I said, T-Rex wanted to be on the archery team, but, you know, throw it arms. And, you know, that was a, a monumental risk um, from us. But, you know, it just, it shows that you can, on social, you can do that stuff. You can sort of, you know, you can, you can be a little funny. You can, you know, you can try different things. and and. We're trying to be a more public focused institution. I'm reminded, Ryan, of a, of a comment that I read somewhere about the net tweet last week yeah. about the, the booty. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> you know Kim Kardashian break the internet thing? The um, net <laughs> <laughs> posted a photo of a sculpture that they have that is. Remarkably similar. <laughs> Less oil, but remarkably similar. And so he commented that, and I was, I was, I was really struck by this. But there was, um, the, but the people who are going to be offended are not looking at that conversation. They're not on social media, and they're not seeing it. So why are we taking these risks? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, right now, yeah, we don't do it all the time, but um, you know, it, it, I would. I would urge you to, to try it a little bit and see and see what happens. Um, the other thing that we were talking about earlier, um, up until a couple months ago, everyone like if you always see me in the museum standing in a corner or what, staring at my phone or you know in the hallway somewhere staring at my phone, and everyone would walk by and go, "Oh, what's the top score in Angry Birds?" or something. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're playing a game on my phone, right? They don't really understand what we actually do. So I would say. Use your data to your advantage. Um, a couple of months ago, I gave an all staff presentation and I, I mined four years of data on our Twitter account and I blew everyone's mind about how far we were reaching and the conversations we were having. And people don't, people just assume you're just playing a game on your phone. They don't think it's real work. It is real work. It's far reaching. And you know, it's time that people start recognizing the value of social. Um, we have a question really? from Jeff in the back, sorry. Um, do any of the speakers have strategies in place to carry relationships across platforms as networks come and go? <laughs> 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 Where's Jeff? <laughs> 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 I'm going to start thinking about that because I'm actually <laughs> I'm talking with my boss about getting rid of our Facebook page next week. So, uh, we'll see what happens. I'll let you know. Yeah, we actually we have a prison page for our Facebook. Teachers did not like that. So, we, I mean, it was like a two month attempt and it died very quickly. And I thought, and again, after a lot of careful research, it was sort of like I thought, you know, my. Goals were going to be Twitter and Facebook. They hated it. Twitter and Pinterest. So, you know, it was very much audience based. Um, I wanted to be focused on who I was reaching. Um, we interestingly do have a pretty strong Facebook following just because of our specific audience with our mom and sister children's museum. Um, but we do a lot on actually Facebook and Instagram, also Twitter. But we try to sometimes, when it makes sense, we'll direct people across platforms just to make them be aware that things are happening. Um, sometimes there's something really exciting happening on Twitter, and we will let people know it's Love Theater Day over on Twitter. Go over there and check it out. Um, I don't know how successful that is, but it, it just seems like a waste to not let people know of things across different channels. And we also have a really strong Instagram community as well. Um, and so we do try to connect the crafts and make sure that people are aware of where other channels are. 
Uh, please come up and say hi to the panelists, introduce yourself, and have a great afternoon.